Okay. Um, yep. Welcome to the MMM Neurotech Ethics, 25th of the 9th. Uh, I'm going to stop running through the party updates. Um, we've got Brunswick Candidates Forum tomorrow from 6 till 9. Um, Owen is speaking at that. Uh, he's running for the ward of, I cannot pronounce that, in Maribet um, Council, Melbourne. Belecky Beck. I'm pretty sure it's pronounced. I guess I'm, I'll, I'll find out tomorrow either way. Belecky Beck. Okay. <laughs> Um, there's also um, the Brisbane Pride Stall debrief. Um, I heard that went incredibly well. So the debrief will be um, how to continue the awesomeness. Uh, there's a submission writing workshop as well, which Miles will be running uh, this Saturday, six o'clock again, two hours. Um, that's for combating misinfo and for the combating misinfo and disinfo bill. Um, and uh, Owen, Owen's Meribeck campaign launch on the Sunday. So it's a busy weekend. Um, I don't have a time for that. Owen, do you have a time for that one? Uh, yeah, we'll be starting at midday. I should mention, by the way, um, although it would obviously be nice to have fellow Fusion Party people there, um, if you're just a friend of the Fusion Party, um, you're definitely also welcome. Um, I guess uh, it's more like a celebration of the campaign as opposed to like fleshing out policy points. So, yeah. Great. Yeah. Friends, fellow travellers, people who like talking, fantastic. <laughs> um, uh, and then we have a state coordinator support meeting uh, on Saturday the 5th at 6 o'clock. That's, again, open to everyone interested in volunteering for the party. Um, and the final note is that there are currently active campaigns in Sydney, Melbourne and Perth. Um, please sign up to volunteer and make sure your details are up to date. Um, Miles, uh, reading through this list, I see there's a bunch um, of hyperlinks, pretty much one for almost every bullet point that I've just read out. Uh, where can people find those uh, links? We can I'll put all those in the description of the uh, in the, the links in the box below. Make sure to like and subscribe. Links the in the part. description. <laughs> Visiting the events page is also a good idea. Yeah. Great stuff. Um, and uh, that brings us on to the intro from Owen. So I'll hand over to you, Owen. Uh, yeah, so tonight um, our, main, our main topic talk is about neurotechnology. Um, I guess it's worth, you know, many people would consider what does this have to do with a political party? Um, I guess many governments like to say that they don't like to choose specific companies, specific technologies for what's going to win. I guess um, at the other end of the spectrum, you have the uh, the approach dirigisme where like in France, for instance, um, the government plays a role in setting up the, the train company or Air France. Um, Singapore, for instance, is very supportive of its startups. So, you know, it's not unheard of for governments to choose um, sort of winning companies, winning technologies. Um, and then I guess it's also worth noting um, when it comes to brain science, so I guess anything involving living organisms, um, Typically, governments have been very slow to progress in this space, mainly due to ethical considerations. And so they used to be, if we think of the AI race, uh, it's often framed as between the West and China. And for, for many years, it was framed that China is obviously going to win this AI race just because they have apparently you know fewer ethical considerations, um, except what ended up happening is that they applied, I guess, um, sort of 2018 era AI to lots of problems uh, versus we see the breakthroughs now with ChatGPT. Um, and, you know, we could argue that um, as ChatGPT counts as like the new generation of AI, then arguably the West is winning that race. Um, and similarly, you know, if we're going to have this massive transformation from a new technology, uh, then, you know, do we want to be at the forefront of it or do we want to get exploited by nations who are going to be a lot more uh, wealthy and powerful? Um, you know, are we going to remain subservient to them? Um, so with all these um, interesting dilemmas in mind, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Ruben, Ruben Richardson. Um, he's studying at UQ Neurotech. Um, Ruben, would you like to give us a bit of an intro? Uh, hey, Owen, thanks for that intro. Um, uh, very happy to speak for you guys today. Um, I'll just get my, my slides going. Um, am I able to do a screen share? Uh, yeah, do you have the power? Uh, no, no permission. Oh, here we are. Uh, oh, great. Great. Um, 
Yeah, just first of all, I wanted to say thanks for having me on. Um, I've uh, found out about the Fusion Party through Miles a few weeks ago um, and have looked into uh, the website a little bit. And it seems um, it's uh, amazing forward thinking and um, uh, a great a great community. Um, and uh, okay, so I might just get straight into it. Um, so today I'm going to talk a bit about um, neurotechnology, what exactly it is, um, and uh, summarize the um, previous attempts to uh, think about the ethics involved. Um, yeah, so about me, I'm a fourth year, I'm still an undergraduate at UQ. Um, I study electrical and biomedical engineering with a dual degree in computer science. Uh, I founded the club of UQ Neurotech when I realized that it's a neuroscience club at, at the university. And uh, we had a few other mates that um, founded it with me and it uh, has, you know, um, turned into a, quite a thriving club with uh, over a um, hundred financial members at this stage. Um, and we run hands-on events uh, involving neurotechnology, which I'll get into a bit later. Um, finally, I've, this year I've done a bit of volunteering at the UQ Biobotics Lab, uh, which um, experiments with um, the uh, nervous system of, of insects and, and modulating that. Um, which is very exciting work. So there's lots of cool neurotech stuff happening at, at UQ. Um, all right, so firstly, uh, what is neurotechnology? Um, here's a definition from the NeuroRats Foundation. Neurotechnology refers to devices capable of recording or altering the activity of the nervous system, including the brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves. Um, there was a different paper uh, earlier than that in 2021 that classified it into four categories. Uh, first being neuroimaging, second being neurodevices, third being brain computer interfaces, and, and fourth being um, more of the computational uh, neuroscience um, and AI. Uh, yeah, so, so neuroimaging refers to more of the medical practice of uh, fMRI, EEG, uh, very powerful techniques. Um, Neurodevices can rely on um, some of the neuroimaging techniques, uh, but also have, um, so examples of neurodevices would be classic deep brain stimulation devices, um, uh, as well as the newer um, NeuroEP from Synchron and Neuralink from, uh, from um, the Neuralink uh, implant from Neuralink. And um, brain computer interface is a different category that has a lot of overlap with the first two as well. Uh, just generally controlling another peripheral apart from your own body. Um, and finally, the fourth classification uh, you, could, you could say is the, the non-organic neurotech. It's um, uh, trying to emulate neural circuits um, digitally. Uh, and also the entire field of AI is quite inspired by um, organic neuroscience. Um, so that sort of domain. All right, so I just wanted to um, go over one of an example of the neuroimaging, and it's quite impressive. Um, this was done last year. Uh, it's a natural scene reconstruction from fMRI signals using generative latent diffusion. So generative latent diffusion is, is quite a recent development. It's part of the latest AI boom, um, and they're sort of utilizing it to um, essentially uh, decode um, visual data from the brain. Uh, in fMRI. Um, fMRI just measures the small changes in blood flow in, in the micro vessels of the, of the brain. And they're able to use that to um, construct a, a latent vector, um, which is then decoded into a full image. Um, obviously there's a training process involved, but if you have a look there, you can see that um, on the far left is a test image. And that's the image that the, uh, that the um, patient or, or uh, person is being shown um, and their fMRI data is being fed into the model. Um, and these four, these subject one, subject two, these are individual subjects and that's the image that's reconstructed um, from their, purely from their brain signal. Um, and as you can see, it's frighteningly or uh, surprisingly accurate in its structure and content um, at decoding the brain. Um, this average one is them averaging together the latent, uh, the latent vectors, um, which is uh, um, part of an under, under the hood mechanism. But um, all of these images here are 
straight from the, um, the person's mind. So this is quite powerful and it's getting to be even more powerful um, as in, in correlation with the AI boom. Um, all right. Um, and uh, just on the other end of the spectrum, I wanted to show off some of the uh, consumer devices that you can get. Um, uh, and this is the stuff that we play around with at the ETH Neurotech Club. Um, so first of all, uh, we have, this is one of the first, uh, I'm not sure. If oh yeah, Ruben, can you turn off screen share for a moment? Pause the screen, screen share. Uh, then it, it'll show your face talking, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, perfect. Yeah, so this is the first device that I wanted to sort of show in the consumer neurotech. It's made by the Emotive company. Um, it's called the Emotive Insight. They've re they've subsequently done more advanced ones, but this one's got around four electrodes and a base electrode here, uh, an EEG device um, aimed at uh, consumers um, to I don't know, um, monitor their meditation and uh, maybe even do a bit of programming. Um, the next one that we've been able to play around a bit with at Neur Neurotech is this Neurosity Crown, which is a bit more of a recent one. It's got eight electrodes um, all across the brain at different lobes. Uh, these are all clinical positions. So you, uh, researchers can use this headset to do to do research. Um, these are two of the base electrodes. It's a uh, dry electrode, so it's easy to put on and put off. Um, Finally, um, this is the one we're currently working on. It's not complete, but this is the OpenBCI Ultra Cortex uh, headset. It's open source, completely open source. And, um, and this is great because it's high quality and uh, cheap if you, can, if you can in fact make it. So that's what we're working on at the moment. All right, so I'll put my screen back on. Oh, Ruben, just quickly, you said uh, oh, BCI. What's BCI? Brain-Computer Interface? Yeah, acronym oh, for Brain-Computer Interface. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so these are all EEG, so electroencephalology, um, just reading voltages on the scalp of the brain. Uh, that's, that's all it is for these consumer ones. All right, so now I'm going to get into the summary of the UNESCO conference. Um, all right, so... This is a conference called the International Conference on the Ethics of Neurotechnology. It's done in France, uh, in Paris on the 13th of July last year. Uh, yeah, the title is Towards an Ethical Framework in the Protection and Promotion of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. Um, well, it's part of the theme of the conference. And this is just a letter from the Secretary General of the UN wishing the conference good luck and, and, and talking about how important uh, talking about the ethics of neurotechnology is right now. All right. So the conference went for um, seven hours and 38 minutes. Um, I, I watched the whole thing and um, I've attempted to, uh, you know, um, collate some of the most in, uh, more important points. Um, although if you have time, definitely give it a watch. It's um, pretty comprehensive. Uh, the first part, of the conference is the only part that has slides. Um, the rest of it is just lots of panels and talking. Um, uh, so I've got a few of the most notable quotes in this presentation. Uh, okay, so um, this is the, the first sort of person I wanted to highlight. She's um, called Professor Emily Cross. Um, and she worked with the International Bioethics Committee uh, which is a committee of UNESCO to produce a 56 page report on the ethical issues of neurotech. Um, and that was done in, in December of 2021. Uh, this is the first attempt to maybe collate some thoughts on um, a, a formal attempt to collate thoughts on the ethics of neurotech. Um, and uh, she's got a definition there that was part of that report. Uh, here's the report. Um, they go over, you know, uh, the categories of existing neurotech. They go over a bit of the ethics and how it applies to law, and how to how to use that to govern um, the industry. Uh, so that's kind of the first formal report that I am aware of. Um, in this report, they they 
do the four categorizations that I talked about um, at the start uh, is with, um, with images this time. So your neuroimaging, your devices, PCIs, and AI. All right, so uh, this is Professor Irve Sneewijs. Um, and uh, here is a slide that just highlights the importance of um, good governments in this industry. Um, and uh, so um, he sort of highlights the qualities of openness, transparency, honesty, accountability. Um, the first two of which are, are most definitely not being adhered to any errors of the private neurotech endeavors currently. Um, so Synchron, Cochlear, and Neuralink come to mind as some of the private companies at the forefront of invasive neurotech. Um, and much like any other private companies uh, in their industry, they don't necessarily have to be open or transparent about what they're doing. Um, I doubt, for example, that they provide a copy of the source code uh, of their implants to their patients or customers. Um, and so that, that means that there are people in the world now that are using proprietary software that is built right into their brains. Um, so that's a, a bit of a concern. Um, and it's uh, maybe a little bit unfair to judge these companies right now because except for Co Cochlear, they're all very early clinical. They're all in very early clinical stage trials. Um, uh, and at the same time, it might be important um, but at the same time, it might be more important to get this good governance thing going early, even before it reaches a large um, consumer base. Um, okay, so this is the first time they, they touch upon the concept of euro rights. Um, and this is, this is inside the report as well. Um, they're a bit vague here when they define it. Um, however, over the course of the next seven hours of the um, conference, there's a lot of discussion um, that they had trying to clarify the concept of euro rights. Um, specifically, one of the main points was whether or not neuro rights are already encapsulated, uh, encapsulated within the existing system of general human rights, um, or if they're thought to be a, a separate thing. By the end, I'd say that the prevailing opinion of the panel is that they should be encapsulated already within human rights. Um, and if they're not, we should make an effort to incorporate neuro rights within uh, this existing framework. Um, okay, so here's a really good quote by Hervé. Um, and he says, are we going to upgrade our humanity by using new tools or are we going to downgrade our humanity by becoming tools? Um, Unfortunately, in the realm of software and our computers, and especially on our phones um, and tablets, we have collectively really leaned into downgrading humanity and becoming tools. Um, tools to whom? Well, advertisers and general profit incentives. Um, it's not been a huge problem so far, but it might be when we begin to let companies into our minds. Um, would you let Google into your mind, Microsoft uh, or Facebook? Uh, Think of those poor Apple users out there who have already had their minds compromised. Um, so talk, talk I think I'll move on from, users, yeah. from this quote. Oh, sorry. Say so, again. Yeah. You're talking to a room full of Linux users here. <laughs> ah, great. <laughs> Very good. Appreciate that then. Um, okay, so that was a great quote. Um, one of the highlights, I think. Uh, and um, I'll move on to uh, this uh, doctor here, um, Dr. Amelia stominova Um she says, I would like to hear how we can address the risks of neurotechnology. Um, but I really believe that this is, uh, that this phobia of the new technologies uh, and what scares us the most should not stop us from the development. Um, so that's just a point there that I'd like to highlight. Um, you know, a, a lot of people have an innate fear of uh, technology invading their mind. Uh, do we try to substantiate this fear? Do we listen to the fear? Um, is it important? Uh, and um, you know, maybe maybe a, a, an intuitive fear against this stuff is is in, is uh, is good enough to to provide a real concern. Um, all right. So this is another 
another lady in the panel, Kame Artigas. Um, she says, we should not be happy just protecting our brain data, just the same as any other biometric data. Treat brain data as a human organ. Um, she says that in general, the barrier of consent is, is not enough. Um, you know, I could consent to sell my kidney, but I'm not authorized to do so um, just by myself to any other company. Um, so if we treat brain data as a human organ like that, um, we can therefore prevent internationally the, con the commercialization of brain data. If we treat it as an organ as opposed to just any other biometric data. So I think that's a good point there by, by Khan. Um, another point here by Dr. Carolina Gainsler. Uh, delinquency is a problem that affects many countries. If we can intervene in people's brains, some could think that the problem of delinquency can be fixed by intervening with brains to change that behavior. Um, so yeah, the, the concept of using um, neurotech to, to do law enforcement is perhaps a little bit um, unlikely to happen in, in Western countries which have got this precedence of, of valuing freedom and, and lack of government intervention. Um, and uh, But it, it might be the case that um, more authoritarian governments around the world could take advantage of neurotech um, and uh, would they use it to address problems of delinquency and uh, to, to enforce laws through the mind? Um, is this um, concern, even though it might not be a problem in the West, enough to, to maybe um, adjust how we uh, develop or continue with the industry? Okay, so this is Kame Artigas again. Uh, she has a number of more quotes that I found pretty um, insightful. She says, uh, the stakes are so high that we cannot just let uh, or become observers of what technology does and wait until we solve the consequences. Um, we cannot pretend to play God. Just because something is technically feasible, it doesn't mean we should do it. Um, those who developed the atomic energy uh, Atomic Energy realized that they need an international agency for it. Should we have an international agency to regulate AI and neurotechnologies? Um, and a final point there is technology is not a problem uh, in, in itself. It's, it's what we do with the technology that matters. Um, and her example is um, a hammer can be good. Um, I can, or, you know, or I can knock your head and kill you with it. Um, so technology is not the problem. The hammer is not the problem. It's, it's what you do with that. So. It might be the case that we don't regulate the development or the progression of the technology itself, but we, um, we provide lots of uh, barriers um, in, in its use. Okay. Here's another interesting point about semantics of this industry. Um, so maybe we need to transition, if we're talking about software of the mind, hardware of the mind, maybe we need to transition away from thinking of ourselves as users and more so as something with a little bit less of a passive undertone to it, like, like actors or something like that. Um, uh, users sort of says that we're maybe um, passively using a product when really, when a product is part of our, our brain itself, it's, it's different than us maybe simply using it. It's, it's more us, you know, um, maybe, you know, it, we should change our vocabulary on it. Um, Okay, um, this is Professor Raphael Yuste. Um, at the time of this conference, he had been partway through a, uh, a study on uh, consumer neurotech and, and what their consumer agreement says and, and, and how ethical they are. Um, so he, at this time, he had only looked at 18 companies, but um, this is what he found. 18 out of 18 neurotech companies take possession of all the brain data without exception. Moreover, 17 out of 18 endow upon themselves to share that brain data with third parties. So pretty horrendous um, as far as that study goes uh, in terms of taking possession and, and also like downloading your brain data onto their own servers and also just you know, mostly sharing it with, with um, anyone they want to. Um, yeah, so uh, you stay here, Professor, you stay um, Professor of Biological Sciences in Neuroscience. Uh, he's advised the Chilean Senate, which has been quite um, at the forefront of neurotech 
regulation in the world. Um, so the Chile government's doing pretty well in this area. Um, it advises the Spanish National Neurotechnology Center um, on neurotechnology policy issues as well. Uh, but what he also did was found this Neuro Rights Foundation. Um, so I just wanted to point this that, that this out that this foundation existed. Um, and this Neuro Rights Foundation is the one that finished the report. And so they finished it actually in April this year. Um, and it turns out they looked at um, 30 different neurotech companies this time um, instead of 18. Well, yeah, the actual publishing of, of that paper he was talking about. Um, and this is what they found. So uh, 29 out of 30 companies appear to have access to the, the neural data of their consumers and provide no meaningful limitations on the access. Uh, consumers don't have adequate information about the data practices uh, of, of, and the privacy and, and rights of uh, the users of the, of the company, of the companies. Um, there's enormous ambiguity uh, regarding whether companies uh, consider neural data as a form of personal data. So um, there's a difference between maybe your date of birth uh, and um, you know a thought or a or a, uh, an EEG reading. Um, many of these companies don't don't distinguish the two data types: of regular personal data versus neural data. Um, and this these should be probably considered separately. Um, data collection and storage practices are ambiguous in these companies. Almost all the companies can share the data with third parties, which is uh, one of the most concerning ones. Um, the extent to which companies can or cannot sell data is unclear in their user agreements. User rights, such as withdrawing consent to data processing and requesting data deletion, are not uniformly extended uh, across the companies. And um, data safety and security provisions of consumer neurotech companies are generally ill-equipped to safeguard your data. So um, even if the companies did have the best intentions, their own policies aren't aren't robust enough to protect the, the data from being uh, maybe um, taken by the government or, or something similar to that. Um, okay. So yeah, moving on from that study, um, should be a rather alarming study um, in this space. Uh, okay, so this is Professor Judy Isles. Um, and she says, we don't want investments that distract from innovations that actually address human suffering, whether they're in the context of the world population or in the context of medical and health conditions. I think what she's saying essentially here is that we shouldn't go for lofty uh, dreams and ideals in, in, in neurotech and we shouldn't be aiming for um, the expansion of consciousness before we've treated um, the, ver the various neurological conditions that um, this technology should be having its energy towards uh, in the meantime. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's a point that she's had there. Okay, so this is Professor Marcelo Lenka. Um, he's one of the advocates for neuro rights should be incorporated within human rights. And he references uh, human rights, such as the privacy of the mind as maybe potential um, amendment to human rights, freedom from undue influence or manipulation, uh, and prevention of harm as a way to incorporate neuro rights into human rights. Dr. Molina Costas Pasakas uh, is a, she, she says, um, an international document is necessary to some extent, but I stress that it is my personal opinion. Um, so she's advocating for an international level document to regulate neurotechnology. Um, which, given the new universal relevance of, of the field, it might be a great, great idea. Okay. Uh, one of the last speakers here, Nita Farahani. Um, she's been a, uh, at the forefront of talking about ethics and surrounding neurotech for quite a while now. Um, uh, she's written a book on it. Um, she says the first generation of models of tech platforms that have been built upon surveillance capitalism. Uh, so the first generation of models are built upon the concept of 
surveillance capitalism. We've seen how far that goes, the effect on mental health, attention, and distraction. So clearly referencing Facebook and Instagram, uh, YouTube, that's those sort of companies. Um, she says, we have a new category of technology that could be really transformation, transformational, be incredibly empower, empowering, could help us to have access to our own brains and to be able to see the loss of our attention, to be able to address neurological disease and suffering. We could have much better access to ourselves than um, what we currently do. To have a new and more natural way to interact with the rest of our technology would be a great, a great prospect. Um, so just, I guess, reminding that this is perhaps a quite a, quite a, despite the concerns, it's probably quite a great thing to pursue. Um, she says implanted technology is already in clinical trials, but hasn't gone to scale yet across society, and that matters. So we're not at a point where the tech is already out there. Um, we can act now and, and make some great regu regulations and, and put some barriers in place before it gets too per pervasive. Okay, um, this is Daphna, Dr. Daphna Feinholz. Uh, she's the chief of the bioethics and, uh, and ethics of science at UNESCO. Um, uh, and this is basically the end of the conference, um, the, the UNESCO conference on neurotech. And she says in the last 10 minutes of the conference, she says that no one here is against the development of neurotech. Um, and this maybe might be a fault of the conference. Uh, maybe they, you know, um, they could have invited more people who are maybe against um, the advancement or the development of neurotech because it's not entirely clear that it's a great it's a great industry to continue to progress um, or at least that should be an open question that that is represented in these discussions um, so uh, or it might be the case that we have consensus as well so um, just interesting to note uh, she has another point here about um, how do we inspire people to care about the industry. Um, and this is something that an aspiration that you can Neurotech, uh, the, the club that I, that I work at, um, aligns with very closely. We, we, can, we inspire uh, people to care about this, this technology by providing hands-on events and, and generally um, hopefully pretty fun events for people to engage in. Um, okay, so that's, um, that's the end of the summary of the UNESCO conference. Um, uh, if you, you, you might not have as much FOMO about missing out on the eight hours now, which is um, hopefully one of my goals. Um, so, so now I'll just go into the last couple of topics um, in the talk. Uh, so I wanted to talk about um, the ethics of neurotech and its relation to the free software movement. And then the final topic um, will be uh, some me metaphysical concern. Um, am I doing okay for time before I jump into this? Oh, yeah, all good. Okay. And cool. you got a good seven minutes, um, including questions. So probably want to wrap up in a minute or two, Ruben. Okay, sounds good. All right, cool. So um, the free software movement um, was uh, was pioneered before um, for essentially the internet age, um, uh, and it's it summarizes the freedom to share, study, and modify your digital tools. Um, these are the four freedoms. Uh, the freedom to run the program as you wish, um, the freedom to study how the program works and change how it does work, um, the freedom to distribute copies so you can help other people, and the freedom to distribute modified copies to others and maybe even sell them. Uh, these are all uh, essentially freedoms that are um, posited as respecting your freedom as an individual um, that has this software. Um, essentially, it, it, uh, it might be the case that we, we need to adopt free software in, in neurotech in order to give people uh, liberty over their own minds. Um, the, the prospect of a company having power over you by providing Clyde, uh, closed source firmware is quite a scary one. And um, maybe it does need to be mandated this time uh, that the software in your mind is, is um, free or, or libre. Um, so that's, that's the point there essentially. Okay, um, this is a picture of the Dutch East India Company, um, one of the first 
uh, publicly traded companies in the world. Ricardo is maybe the first multinational corporation, 16, founded in 1602. Um, just, just to represent how recent and, and maybe, maybe also how outdated the, the model of the modern corporation is um, and that it could be subject to change. And, and maybe specifically for this purpose of neurotechnology, we should have a, take a look at the corporation model and, and see if, um, first of all, would you let any corporation into your mind? If the answer is no, then uh, essentially we don't have an organization or, or um, a group of people who could, could do that at this stage. So maybe we need to think about the structure and um, maybe how it needs to be amended or changed for this specific, specific purpose. And how could you do that? Maybe the standards of this organization are ma maintained dem democratically, maybe adjacent to the government or without involvement with the government. Um, administration should be decentralized, perhaps. Um, this is unlike any other organization or, or corporation. Uh, maintained as a, a connected structure of plain text files. This is maybe a bit more specific, but um, uh, a public repository of, of, um, of maintained text files would be a great way to uh, to share the administration of, of such an organization uh, and also the encouragement of somehow um, anonymous collaboration would be a great thing. Uh, the inspiration, of course, would be the Genio Linux um, platform that has been built up uh, anonymously across the world um, and is quite a high quality piece of um, software and has a lot of ethical considerations that's gone into it. Um, and somehow many people have been able to agree, produce a software that is quite you know, uh, empowering and, and um, productive for, for society. Okay, so this is the last slide of content, I'm pretty sure. Um, just a, a brief note on the metaph metaphysical concerns of the industry. Um, it is not yet completely clear what, uh, um, what governs the continuity of self. Uh, how do we know that we're the same person as we were yesterday? How do we know that we're the same person as we were 10 years ago or even a second ago? What links all that together and what gives us a sense of self or continuity? Um, this of course is a precious thing that needs to be preserved somehow um, with mind aug augmentation. Uh, and because we don't really know how it works, uh, we should approach the, the concept of preservation of continuity of self as, as a quite a, um, a careful thing to do. Uh, similarly, you also need to preserve consciousness. Maybe it is the same as continuity of self. Um, there's, there's a lot of debate whether or not consciousness is already encapsulated in, in modern physics or whether it's not. Um, this industry could very much provide more insight into, into that sort of discussion. Okay, uh, these are my references and um, thank you for listening. Thanks, Ruben. That was great. Um, there are a few minutes for questions. Does anyone have a burning question to ask Ruben after that? It's two hands. Oh, and do you want to go first? <laughs> okay. Um, I guess more of a comment. Um, I, I really like that you included the stuff about the um, open source free software. That you oh, you're, you're a little quiet, Owen. Oh, sorry. It's, it's just the micro. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, um, in terms of the open source software movement, um, yeah, you know, uh, many of us in Fusion are big fans. I don't think it's explicitly Fusion policy, um, but it, it, either way, uh, you know, there are many scientists, engineers in Fusion. You know, we definitely see the value in that. Um, in terms, you mentioned though that um, maybe we should mandate open source software running in your mind. I guess that um, wouldn't people want to anyway. Um, do they really need this control? But I guess um, maybe the market doesn't pan out that way. But I guess, um, yeah, sorry, the question component of this is, um, I don't know if you and everyone else is familiar with the Humane AI pin. Um, I'll just share. Yeah, yeah, for um, anyone who doesn't remember it, that was it. Um, and yeah, you can see in the launch video, you know, people were, um, people were critical that even the founder himself um, wasn't really sold on the idea. And, uh, I, I seem to remember it being described as the worst piece of hardware ever made. <laughs> uh, not far off my description, but um, 
my view was more that it just wasn't very useful. Um, I wonder, yeah, Ruben, can you characterize, um, you know, I guess open source and the, the closed source models, how would you characterize it in your internet in the back? Uh, yeah, so um, I haven't been able to do a huge amount of research into exactly how each of the companies do operate. Um, my guess is that um, as far as Neuralink goes, they're pretty closed in their operations. They've been criticized in the past for not being open in their practices um, and not following the standards of the research, uh, research field. They're, of course, a private company, so they don't need to follow by law um, the, the standards of, 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 of research. Um, uh, so, so I guess maybe it is the role, um, of some government or some organization to, to mandate, uh, to mandate that, that these softwares do need to be open, um, and understand that, uh, maybe it could be a natural market force to, to have, um, open source in people's minds. But I mean, one thing is, I don't think, um, I don't think the, the free software, um, ideology is too widespread. I don't think people put that as their first priority when they're getting an implant. Um, uh, so, you know, people getting cochlear implants are not concerned with whether or not their, the, the firmware inside the, their implant is, is open source. They're more concerned with whether or not it'll restore their, their hearing. Um, and so, uh, in some sense, um, due to the lack of awareness, you know, you might not have that natural force. And so maybe you do need something more of a, a regulation, um, cause it's a specific concept that maybe only software engineers or computer scientists will understand. Yeah, I think that's I think that's probably very true. Most uh, most people out there are much more concerned with the shiny and the interesting and, and not really thinking about the risks and dangers. Uh, should we go to Miles? Miles, I think you had your hand up as well. Yeah, the um a quick sort of question first. Let's get those references as well up on the um up on the video description. And would you be okay with sharing your slides as well? Yeah, I'll, I'll try my best. It's um, it's a it's a web app slide thing. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe try my best to to put it into a, a slide format. Okay, cool. Uh, one point which I found really interesting. So echoing Alan's comments about the open source tech, love that. Um, the it kind of heads off the uh Deus Ex, uh, future where private corporations control the things we put in our body, and then there's a massive conspiracy for them to sabotage them all at the uh, at, at an opportune moment and there's a, a very eerie kind of um, art becomes life thing happening as well with the recent um, it, uh, Israeli bombing of Lebanon with the detonation of pages all, all across the country simultaneously um, thousands of them uh, which required a very sophisticated uh, supply chain control of those devices the manufacturing shipping and deployment of those devices and so um, you know, if, if state actors have that capability, then private actors with similar resource, so multinationals with similar resource to state actors will also have that capability as well, especially in less regulated countries and parts of the world, or with uh, potentially malicious state actors who will not have a regulatory environment, will not respect a regulatory environment for that. Uh, so I, I guess swinging more towards the question, one other thing that I really liked from your talk was the from from a sort of an ethics side, I guess the principles of regulation we'd want to look at apart from um, uh, acknowledging sort of the neuro rights thing, but in a general term, the principles of governance, uh, I can't remember the speaker, but he advocated for openness, transparency, honesty, and accountability. And I think that's really important to, um, to at least approach from a principles first basis. And then you can sort of extrapolate so much out from that uh, interesting conversation on as a sort of side conversation, human rights. But do you see uh, the, the question in my head that's right, right popped up when I saw those four, first, first four recommendations? Ruben, do you see that there may be um, similarities or overlaps with general principles of good governance? So if we're looking at things like how we design government, an ideal government to work? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, you, you, yeah. You could argue that current governments don't operate on first principles as much as um, they, they should uh, and that maybe um, yeah maybe we need to be aware of of that and and not trust government um, processes um, you know as a, as a force to regulate the industry as well um, so maybe, maybe something like 
and its national agency or uh, something that is maybe even more trustworthy than, than any government that, that we might have uh, is, is, is needed, um, definitely. Uh, does, that, does that answer um, uh, some of it? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, on, this, um, on the governance question actually it reminds me, um, you know, the, the Australian government has been slow to respond to any new technologies. And I guess, you know, myself and Miles have been um, involved in writing submissions about Australia's use of AI. Um, but then I guess we also saw, you know, during COVID, um, uh, you know, society managed to quickly adopt um, remote work finally. Um, and so it makes me think like if, if Australia is being slow in adopting neurotechnology, like, you know, we have all these examples of Australia being slow before, but then as well, you know, like once Australia did finally adopt remote work, uh, I'm not sure how it was in the other cities, but definitely in Melbourne, I saw um, there were signs up by the government saying things along the lines of, let's get back to the CBD, let's get back to the office. Hey, why? You, you can go back to the office. I want to stay here. <laughs> and so, you know, governments are used to reinforcing the status quo. Um, and so I guess, yeah, maybe um, Ruben, you and, you know, maybe the others have an opinion as well. Like, and, and are we being too cynical? Is this the logical part for that, you know, the Australian government is not going to adopt neurotechnology and is instead just going to try to get in its way? Yeah, um, I'm not sure what the incentive for, uh, process was for, um, you know, going back to, for, forcibly going back to, um, uh, you know, um, live work. Um, of course, there's a number of different concerns with homework uh, as well. Um, I guess it, it, it would take away from all the local businesses if you're staying in your home. Uh, so maybe that's maybe one of the incentives that, that the Melbourne government had was to get people back onto the transit route and stopping by small businesses. Um, uh, of course, everything is done by cars now. So um, that's not such a great point. But um, uh... I've, I've got a follow-up, Ruben, which which kind of ties in a little bit with, with Owen's question um, around trust of government and trust of institutions. If you're regulating a, a new technology that has, you know, both really big potential to change what people are and how people interact, uh, and that's uh, touches a little bit on. Um, I think it was Carme Artigas. Uh, in your presentation, suggesting a you know like a IE, IAEA equivalent for regulating AI and neurotech, and my immediate thought there was really both under one umbrella. Like they feel fairly separate, and like they've got different threats and risks. What's your feeling on on the you know the sense the, the sense in which they overlap in terms of their risks and threats and opportunities? Uh, so which two things overlap? I missed the two things. Uh, the neurotech itself and machine learning AI. Oh, yeah. Um, well, uh, as you saw from that neuroimaging one, um, that could only be done with, with AI. Uh, so uh, with, with the modern you know, generative latent um, AI that, we, that, that I showed. Um, and uh, I guess in that, in that case, yeah, so we have a, basically an opaque box here full of signals that um, you know, we can't, can't possibly um, comprehend the magnitude of signals coming out of the brain and also the the opaqueness of the signals. Um, and so you essentially do need a, a, an artificial intelligence um, that can, can churn through all the data and get something out of it. Um, so I think Neurotech is incredibly linked to AI. We'll have, always have a lot of overlap because um, essentially we'll always need automated uh, systems to, to interpret brain signals. It, it'll never gotcha. go away. Yep. Yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. I guess the pattern recognition and the scanning always have to go together to make anything meaningful. That, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I, just to to finish answering Owen's question um, about government's reluctance to to bring on new new technology. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's, it's it's a good idea to not rely on the government as as a as a, a source for primary innovation um, for sure. Uh, and so. I guess it could be, you know, in Australia, I guess there's um, a lot of innovation done by the government in comparison to, to many other governments. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, if a, if a popular case could be made to 
maybe put a more of a um, regulated effort into neurotech and, and more funding into it. I think Australia could be quite successful in the industry. We, we don't want another big American company inside of our brains. Um, I, I think I think Australia is pretty well positioned to be a trustworthy uh, Western company that a uh, country that could could pop out a number of great um, medical technology. They've already done it with Cochlear. Um, we've already done it with um, Synchron, one, basically the leading um, invasive neurotech company for, for a good while. Um, and uh, and also with Bivacor, which is the total artificial heart replacement. These are all amazing uh, Australian medical technologies. Um, that so that think, was non-invasive, you said, right? Non-invasive. Uh, which, which one? Uh, the, uh, the you synchron? said the, the Australia has the lead um, product for, was it non-invasive or invasive? Synchron is invasive. So they, oh, right. they use something called the Stentrode. So they, um, they put that same concept of the stent from your heart, inside your heart, to open gotcha. the blood vessel up from a clot. Um, but they make it electrically conductive, turn it into an electrode, or at least a series of electrode channels within the stent. Uh, and then they feed up the electrodes into the brain. Um, the wow, brain that's a whole nother level of crazy from the helmets you showed us. Yeah, so um, exactly. Yeah, very invasive and, and quite successful because every surgeon knows how to put a stent in. So very good idea by seeing um oh and your your hand is still up um oh yeah um thanks Ruben. um in terms of the government's involvement um yeah i definitely agree with you that we shouldn't rely on the government um uh, i guess yeah i was more curious um, about it getting in the way but um a, a, another point actually um for our viewers who might not be as familiar um ruben you mentioned um something about like selling data and selling organs and things um in case our viewers aren't aware, Iran actually allows the trade of kidneys, and I've heard that it's actually very successful. Um, if we compare, um, so I used to live in the US for seven years, and um, there's been recent controversy there about how if someone needs a new kidney, um, so either they get a kidney transplant or they receive dialysis for you know the rest of their life either until they get the transplant, and um, unfortunately. Uh, the dialysis treatment centers are being um, all bought up by the same private equity firms and they've been caught out actually discouraging their patients from getting the transplant. They've been encouraging them to stay on dialysis forever instead. And so if you can compare that with um, Iran buying and selling organs and if you need a new kidney, you just buy one. There's, you know, there's an abundance of kidneys. Um, and so from this perspective, I wonder, um, uh, Miles, maybe you have been a bit on this as well, but um, I guess number one, is selling organs such a bad thing? And um, I guess, yeah, number two, you know, selling thoughts, selling your brain workings, maybe it isn't so bad after all. Yeah, no, I'm keen to see what, what Miles thinks on this as well. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's very tricky gray area of, of new new we need to come up with new ideals essentially uh, and uh not sure which one will result in in the uh, most optimum outcome um you know treating organs as something that you know you need government approval to sell uh is um one concept that that, that might lead to some 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 outcome and um well I mean, there's concerns both ways of course if it's just a free market of organs then, you know you, uh, you might be tempted to to sell one of your kidneys um, at some point in your life to to get over a, a medical uh, get over financial ex expense. Um, you know, um, should you know should people be able to sell their own organs? Uh, is a similar question to should we allow people to smoke? Um, it's yeah, um, no, it's a very very gray area. Sort of. yeah, it's, it's really ethically complex. Sorry guys, I've realised I got distracted by the two hands up. I'll just loop back to Millspec's uh, question in the chat. Um, Millspec is asking, uh, should we be concerned about the ethics of experimenting with clumps of human brain cells, some of which are smart enough to solve problems? Oh yeah, fantastic question. Um, so yeah, when, when we ran the, uh, we'd done a, an event on uh, neurotech ethics for our club uh, and I, my UNESCO summary was part of that. Um, but we also had two speakers, um, one of which uh, Miles was able to get on. Um, who work at UQ in organoid, uh, in organoid um, development. So an organoid is basically a, a clump of, of neurons. Um, 
and uh, it's pretty widespread now that you can, uh, many neuroscience labs across the world have gotten their organoids to play Pong. Um, so uh, it's quite quite a widespread thing now. Um, and there's, yeah, there's pretty little development of, of ethical concerns regarding organoids. Um, of course, uh, organoids are the way they are because um, it's sort of the critical mass of neurons that you can have, uh, you can accumulate without needing a blood supply. Um, vasculature um, and so you can't actually make something any anything too complex without adding vasculature which is very difficult to do um, so you're you're limited to a certain amount of conscious experience of course um, and um, they're about I think they're about the size of your finger now um, you can imagine that it's maybe not a humongous ethical concern to be doing experiments in organoids uh, at the moment uh, yeah, so um, absolutely, it's it's definitely a concern, and especially as we we advance beyond organoids and, and give it vasculature and, and more more conscious experience. Um, it, it, yeah, um, you know that's that's definitely something we need to think about. Very much a grey area as, as complexity increases and what they can do increases, and they start to resemble a bit of a human more and more. Absolutely, yeah, already very intelligent. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a whole scary area of uh, of ethics that I hadn't even considered because it's the interface of man and machine but coming from the other side as we sort of assemble a human out of <laughs> out of bits in, yeah in a in a mechanical environment so uh, thanks Ruben uh, miles did you want to wrap up as we um, draw to a close yeah and and in, in in the classic tradition of wrapping up everywhere I'd like to offer a little anecdote which is possibly slightly relevant here. I was giving a talk on uh, humanism and running campaigns, the humanist organization a couple of months ago. And uh, the, uh, so, so I talked a little bit about the things about humanism, which attracted to me. One of my big inspirations was Isaac Asimov, who is often is usually most well known as uh, one of the, one of the most prolific and, and, and best known authors of the golden age of sci-fi an incredible human being what he's not so well known for is the um one of the one of the co-founders of the american humanist movement back in the 50s and 60s and there's a fantastic series of trailers on youtube highly recommend go and check it out and um so he he used to talk about how we could have common cause for our fellow humanity and so to, towards the end of my talk the uh, the question came up from someone where I saw, so it's like, that's where humanity, the, the humanist movement came from and, and has sort of evolved over the years. And so where do I see the humanist movement globally starting to go? And, and so like my, my hair stood and ended up like, well, obviously tra transhumanism that as, as a movement, uh, not all, man, many humanists aren't necessarily moving across to transhumanism. But those of us who do identify as transhumanists, which I consider myself to be one, oh, and I believe you do as well, that uh, we like like the, the the really simple sort of flashy sci-fi way to talk about it is, oh yeah, you're gonna chop off our arms for robot arms off, or upload our brain to computers, you know, all that kind of cool stuff. But like um, Ruben as well, a couple of times in your talk, you mentioned about how we uh, this technology gives the potential to become more than we are and unlock more of ourselves and, and express more of ourselves. And, um, and, and, and so when I was giving this talk, I kind of, uh, I was, uh, I was thinking of it from a few different angles. I thought, okay, well, like, it's not just sort of the flashy robot arms and robot bodies angle, but another way is also that, um, the, the, the possibilities we haven't even considered. And one of those is, is mind uploads and the potential for things like, like brain editing or, or even copy and cloning our brain. If you understand neurotechnology well enough that these, these sort of magic sci-fi concepts, which were like almost inconceivable that now they're being very real possibilities that we can, um, you know, like with fMRI visualization. And I, I actually remember that paper. I read it as well when it came out that it, it's, it's actually happening now that we are producing uh, photorealistic images of, of people's thoughts and memories and if we're able to read memories and thoughts to that degree, then, you know, there's, it's entirely reasonable that, that potentially one day very soon that could go the other way as well. And, um, and I thought like, it's, it's a horrifying thought that, you know, and that came up at the, at the um, UN conference as well. It's a horrifying thought to have people editing your brain, but on the flip side, 
you know, what if that was done consensually and in a way that was fully, fully open and transparent and, and completely safe as well, we would have the option to not just reform our bodies, but also reform our minds as well. And, um, and, and that is incredibly radical, dangerous concept and, 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 and sort of straight like, but, but visionary. And so straight away, the, the person who asked this question responded to me like, oh, that makes me feel really squeamish. And I'm like, yes. Yes, it does, because it's such an alien concept to everything we've considered as, as the potential. And so there's, there's no simple or easy answer here from a regulation sense. Um, oh, oh, and fantastic comment, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. Exactly, yeah. So it's so like, the, but, but that, that, that was sci-fi. That was like completely off the wall, crazy, absurd sci-fi, you know, whenever it came out 10 or 15 years ago, but now it's very much real uh, or, or sort of like a, a, a realistic prospect. So these are the challenges that we are now grappling with as the future, the leading edge of the humanist movement in the world in Australia, but also the transhumanist movement as well. It can't just be about the flashy, cool sci-fi, but we also need to be thinking about what are the ethical implications? What are the regulatory and governance needs to make sure that this, this incredibly powerful technology and all of its potential is unlocked for all of humans in a way that is safe and, uh, and equitable and accessible to everyone? So thank you very much, Ruben. Uh, inspiring talk again now, as in last time. And I hope that, uh, you know, we can we can build this movement, all of us together, in unlocking the potential for new technology in a way that is safe and equitable. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Thanks, all. Let's uh, let's bring the stream down.